It's a new year, and many people hope for blessings. And I put here, blessings comes with responsibility. And sometimes greater blessings or more blessings comes with greater responsibility. Sometimes, uh, for example, uh, I, uh, we just got a line for Louis, a phone line. Uh, so, but it's a cheap line. So sometimes it gets through, sometimes it doesn't get through. It's the same line that I use for myself. So sometimes we call, you cannot receive anything. You know, so if you want a better line, you want a quicker connection, want more data, save, you must pay more, right? So you want a higher pay as a blessing for you yourself, then you must expect more work, greater scope of, uh, for, your job, for your job itself, high, bigger responsibility at your workplace. Some people want blessings of babies. What do you expect? A lifetime of responsibility. The whole trouble of child bringing all comes in lock, stock, barrel, everything. You know, some people say, we want the church to grow. And of course, with the church grow, what do we have? Well, we have more duties, of course, and more interpersonal problems, right? Yeah. So, this is the case of the Israelites people. You know, the number grow, and of course, the responsibility grow, and troubles increase. You know, that's what is happening here in this passage. Here. Let's pray together as we look into this passage in detail. Father, we thank you for your word for us. We pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit be so gracious to speak to us as we listen to your word. And we pray that, God, we will not just seek mere head knowledge for ourselves, but we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will bring this truth into our lives, that this truth may be lived out in our lives in the field of God for your glory's sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we do a re quick recap of what happened at the first part of this chapter, uh, verse 1 to verse 8. So we are saying that it was a new beginning for the Israelites, a new generation, a second generation, and they were about to enter into the promised land. So, and what were they looking at? What gave them the basis to restart again? It is not their faithfulness, it's not their cleverness. You know, we were reminded last week, it was God's grace in covenant making with them. The God was the one who made the covenant with them. And it was it's not that they were very faithful people, actually. If you recap what happened in the 40 years, you remember they were the unfaithful people. They were being, uh, not keeping God's law. In fact, after li not long after leaving uh, uh, Egypt, they were found worshipping the golden calves. Right? They were covenant breakers. So it is, to, it is God's faithfulness that keeps them going. It is God's faithfulness that they have to cling on to for a new start. Because God's faithfulness in, is found in His covenant keeping. And then, nevertheless, God continued to keep His covenant with them and He promised them for increase. And that's what is happening here in verse 9 to 15. I put that as a subtitle as the great increase. So you take a look at verse 9. It began with Moses reminding the Israelites of the present situation that they were facing. What is the situation here? I subdivide it to 9 to 12. The situation is this. They have multiplied many times. Many times. And it is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. In fact, this multiplication is about a promise that God has given to them. You take a look at verse 10. The particular word used there is that they are like stars in the heaven. The stars in heaven. And this make us recall back the actual promise of God itself. You know, so you take a look at Genesis 15, verse 5, and this is what the Lord says to Moses. Hey, wrong. The Lord says to Abraham, you know, and he took him outside and said, look, at, look towards the heaven the num and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then this, is, this will be able to number your descendants. You know, this will be your, your, shall your offspring be or your descendants be. Which then uh, in verse four, uh, coming back to this passage in verse 11, Moses says, I surely wish for them to increase. A thousand fold, a thousand times, verse 11, you know, because this is a blessing. He says, God, may God bless you even further to increase. But this is a present situation here. And with more blessing or greater blessings comes 
like what we said at the introduction, greater responsibility and of course, troubles. Troubles. You know, so this situation, if you see at verse 9, verse 12, Moses repeated again that he was actually overwhelmed by it. He said, I cannot handle you guys alone. You know, you get why was Moses overwhelmed? Why? God increased them. That, that was supposed to be a blessing, isn't it? It is a blessing, actually. It is a blessing. But with the increase of that population, there was an increase of problems. And Moses' load and responsibility actually increased many folks as well. You know, so what are the particular problems? You take a look at verse 12. There are three types of problems that uh, Moses himself identified. So I just try to explain what these three types of problems are. Firstly, he called them weight. You know, in an ESV version, this is called weight. In an NIV version, this is called load. You know, this I define as things that wear other people out. And this word is only used twice in the whole of Old Testament. It is here and in Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it was God saying that the Israelites were a burden, was that weight, the particular word for it. You know, weighing or wearing him out. He said, you are wearing... He's weary, God is weary of bearing them, these Israelites. Why? If you look at the, at the context of uh, Isaiah chapter 1, it is sin. The sin of the Israelites. So in the same way, if you use here, you will understand that what is wearing out Moses was the sin of the people that keep falling, keep failing God himself. You know, so this is a weight for that this leader have to carry. But not just that, he also used words like a burden. This is a common word that used hundreds of times in the Old Testament. It is something that's natural, but yet it's a heavy responsibility and care of the everyday affairs of the Israelites. What to eat, where to go, you know, how to how to how to manage them, how their health problem, their, their provision problem. You know, so it, this is a, a, a word that used that is 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 everyday. And as with the increase of numbers, these will increase as well. You know, lastly, he used the word strife. You know, strife is uh, interpersonal problems. They were probably fighting with one another. And for personal space, probably they will set up their tents. Then their neighbors shift their tents a bit and say, Hey, this is a common space. Why you put your flower pot here? You know, I mean, I don't know whether in the desert they have flower pot, lah. You know, but it's, it's like, you know, they, they were fighting for personal space maybe. And they were probably fighting against other race as well. Because if you notice, they are actually, if you remember in Exodus, right? When they left Exodus, it was not just the Hebrew people living in Exodus. It was recorded there were a large number of other races that actually joined them. You know, so they were probably fighting with other races. Eh, hey, did that skin color for her? Huh? Why you say this? You know, then and they were probably fighting against each other with this sort of thing, and also includes quarrels and complaints against Moses, against God, and against Moses. So this kind of strife that they were constantly showing. So these are all part and parcel of imperfect people of God living in an imperfect world. Right. So I just sum out this portion here. I say, well, therefore, God's people must expect that in this broken, natural broken world because of sin and sinful world because of our sin or sins of other people, the blessing of God comes along with added responsibility, not a bad thing, but with a lot of troubles as well. You know, so just like, like what I said at the beginning in the introduction there, that we want the higher pay, you then you must expect a greater responsibility and a job scope for yourself. You know, you, can, you want the babies, then you must expect more duties and troubles of the uh, child upbringing as well. You know, it, it's more, the blessing of God come in this broken world, it comes with responsibilities and troubles. So, the second part of this portion, Moses reminded them that he actually had a solution for this. You know, so verse 13 to 15. So, Mo Moses suggested a, through the God-given wisdom, you know, if you read in uh, Exodus or Numbers, you through Jethro and also the constant complaint of people, he came out with a solution to select leaders with different scope of responsibility. Some big scope, uh, in charge of a thousand people, some smaller scope, a hundred people, some smaller still, 50 and 10. You know, it is not just leaders that Moses were looking for. If you take a look at it, he's looking for leaders with quality. 
you know, and what kind of quality fits this bill as leaders, leading these troublesome people, growing people mm -hmm. in the wilderness? Well, they should be looking for rich people, influential people, maybe people clever with PhD, or outspoken and eloquent people, you know, or capable people who are doing big projects like the tent making. Well, it doesn't hurt if the person is also tall, dark, and handsome. You know, a bit like Derek Lee, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And well, he's athletic also, well, quite good. But none of this, none of these were qualities that he was looking for. What are the qualities? You know, so, I mean, to, but don't get me wrong, these qualities itself that I've just said, they are not evil in themselves. You get what I mean? Provided, provided people with this quality understand that these are gifts from God, and that doesn't make them one cut above the rest of people, and neither do they look at other people as consider them as lesser. You know, so, but these are not the qualities. Take a look at verse 13, 15. Moses stated these three qualities that he's looking out for. Number one, someone who is wise. And how do you define wise? It's not that he read a lot of book. And the scriptural understanding of wisdom is the in Proverbs, he says, a fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Someone who understands God, who knows God and wants to obey His law. And the word fear God, in the, throughout Deuteronomy, appears many, many times. It's always defined as someone who knows God's law and obeys the Lord of God. This is the true fear of God. This is true wisdom. Not one who can solve a lot of problems, but it's the one who wants to solve problems according to God's word. Want to live out God's word and then serve God according to God's word. This is a wise leader. Number one. Number two criteria is someone who is discerning and the word is per perhaps someone who is perceptive of the situation. He knows what is the problem over there. You know what are the needs of this congregation. He knows what the quarrels about. He is perceptive of the situation. So first, he has a high regard for God. He fears God. Second, he is perceptive of the situation that's happening. Number three, he's also someone who is, well, in ESV version, put it as experienced. But I guess this may not be the best translation. In fact, the word is, the actual word is knowledge or knowing. Someone who is knowledgeable. You know, and, and in the word know in the Old Testament for this particular, Word is always used as people who know someone personally or intimately. You know, this is actually a word also used in like Genesis 4 when Adam knew Eve and they give birth to Cain. You know, this is a personal, intimate knowing of someone. So I put here as someone who knows the people personally and intimately. You know, so what makes a good leader for Moses to choose them? One, he fears God. Second, he knows the situation. Third, he knows the people personally. He's not sitting there ruling from an armchair. You know, so he knows them carefully. Yeah. So the Israelites were actually agreeable to this solution and they managed to select the different leaders. They call them heads, call them officers, call them judges later, you see, for the job. And what do you learn from this account when Moses is reminding them of what had happened? Well, I guess something is very important here and we can remind ourselves too that as the Lord graciously bless his people, he will graciously provide what was needed, the leaders. He provided leaders for them. God bless them. Moses tried to remind the people that God made the covenant with you by his grace. He also graciously provide for us for them, what is needed, leaders for them, you know, and he will rise up suitable leaders to care for the people. Well, the kingdom of God is like that. It's something that very counter culture. You know, kingdom of God is, is not like what we normally understand. What we normally understand about the kingdom is that when the king is there, the citizens pay tributes, give gifts to the king. You know, and after a war, example, the king conquered a certain place, these people who lose the war, these other kingdoms that lose the war, they have to pay tributes, bring gifts 
to the, this king that won the battle or won the war, you know. But the kingdom of God is a reverse of what is happening here. When King Jesus, the king of God's kingdom, had won the war at his death and resurrection on the cross, he has defeated sin, Satan, and death. And he conquered our rebellious heart, you know, and he graciously brings our hearts in submission to him as a king. And not just that, he also graciously included us into his kingdom under his loving rule. But he didn't stop there. He graciously gave us gifts. Instead of us giving gifts to him, he actually gives gifts to us, you know, so, and to take care of us. So I'd like to show you a verse, a, a passage from the New Testament. It says this, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And it described the king. You know, therefore, it is said when he is referring to, the, uh, to Christ himself, he ascended on high, he led captives of the host of captives, people that he conquered this rebellious heart of ours. You know, and he gave gifts to men. And verse 12 says, he gave some as apostles. These are the leaders that he gave. Prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service to build up the body of Christ. You can see when God gathered us as his people, he graciously saved us, conquered our rebellious heart. He also graciously provides what we need. You know, he gave us leaders to lead us. You know, and I put here therefore one implication for us. We must be thankful for to God for the leaders, for his provision for, for us, for church leaders. They are like probably like the you know, one thousand in charge of one thousand hundred fifty tens kind of leaders. So we must be thankful for our elders, our deacons who serve and teach the word of God to us. Or we must also be thankful for the IDG leaders who serve, open a house to show hospitality, teaching the word of God to us. We must be thankful for the C1 teachers, one-to-one -one discipling teachers, you know, who spend their time and effort preparing the lessons to teach us the word of God. And the roles of these leaders are never easy. You know? And what is the key role, example, we come back to Deuteronomy, what is the key role of these leaders? Well, that bring us to the last part of this passage, 16 to 18 the great task given to them. If you look at verse 16 to 17, there's this word that keeps repeating itself at least four times it appears here to judge or judgment. You know, so you have to judge cases that the Israelites are experiencing every day. You know, so they have to judge the dispute and they have to judge them fairly without partiality. You know, whether it is within the Hebrew community or is within the Hebrew people and the foreigners or in our passage put there, the aliens, the people who are of different race. You know, but they are all God's people. You know, so they have to judge this case carefully, whether this is they are small people or they are great people linked to some priests, linked to some Levites in, in their midst. But they are supposed to judge them without partiality. Verse 17 says they are people, they are not supposed to fear men or be intimidate, intimidated by men. They're supposed to fear God you know, and not, so be, not supposed to be fear, fearful of men. Why? Verse 17 tells us the reason. Because the judgment belongs to God. So this is a great task that they have. The leaders are supposed to represent God in their decisions, in their judgment that they make. Can you see how serious that is? They are supposed to make ju uh, judgment of these cases not based on their wisdom. They are supposed to base it on the word of God itself so that they can represent God carefully, correctly. You know, so that's why they need leaders who are wise who are earnest to keep the word of God and practice the word of God in their own lives first. They need leaders who are discerning of the situation to know what's the actual problem so that they will not be impartial. They also need leaders who are understanding or have, are knowledgeable to their own people, the people that they are ministering to, to so that he, know them, he knows them intimately, personally, and he can make right judgment. So, 
as God has graciously blessed His people, He will graciously provide what is needed for His people as well, leaders to build His people up. So I just sum up this passage here. I think Moses wants the people to understand God is gracious to save them, lead them out. God is also very gracious to provide leaders to minister to them. They have to trust. They have to trust God for this. They cannot take things into their own hand. They have to trust that God has saved us. God will give us, God has given us the best. What will He withhold from us? Nothing. So he will, in fact, give the people what they need, good leaders to, to help them, to serve them. Not perfect leaders, of course, but leaders who trust, who are wise, who fear God, who knows them, who knows the situation to serve them or to minister to them. They have to trust in a good God for this. So a few applications for us. immediate one if you are a leader of any kind of all levels we have to take our task very very seriously because we represent god in our judgment of any issues our teaching of our administration we represent god in our discipline or church discipline we actually represent god in passing on any judgment you know so we are not supposed to do it likely. We are not supposed to do it based on my liking or the world's value system. We are supposed to do it according to God's principle for God's glory. Therefore, leaders, we must grow in wisdom, knowing the word of God and practicing the word of God for our lives. Second, we must grow to be perceptive people who understand situation, weigh them up carefully. Lastly, we must be leaders who knows our people. We don't rule or we don't lead people from an armchair. We don't lead them from an arm's length. You know, we must get to know people personally. Second, if you are a member, well, you must be thankful that God has provided leaders for us. So you must give the leaders a right respect that they deserve because they represent God. If we disrespect them, at the end of the day, we don't really have to answer to them, of course. At the end of the day, during Judgment Day, we, have to answer, we are answerable to God. You know, so we have to give them the right respect and submit to them. And if their direction is biblical, their direction is uh, what the Word of God says, then we have to submit to this uh, direction. But in a postmodern era, in fact, we are the post-postmodern era, leadership or authority is always treated with suspicion at best. At its worst, people may not even uh, be, just be suspicious. They will even question, challenge the leaders. You know, just because things are not done in their ways, according to their ways. You know, they think that they are smarter. They think sometimes they even think that they are more spiritual than the leaders. You know, so it would be good to bear in mind that a true leader, a true member, a wise person is not just how much you understand, how much you know. How much even the Bible knowledge that you have is how much you obey the word of God. Yeah, so these are true wise leader and wise member who fear God. So lastly, between leaders and members, I think because they understand this is God's gracious provision, they must work together. And by working together, I put there, there are three things. You participate humbly with your time and talent and don't think that we are better than other people. Our suggestion must be better than other people. Our suggestion must be taken. You know, so we participate humbly, giving our time and talent. Not just that, we also pray along earnestly with one another for the service that we are doing. And we give generously for what, of using our resources for God's work, for the purpose of uh, expansion of the gospel ministry. You know. So we may build one another up, we may build God's church up, and the ultimate purpose is that God's people are built up. And people who have not known our Lord Jesus Christ may hear of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, 
let me just end off with a reflection. How have you been cooperating with leaders placed above you in church? If you're going to rate yourself 1 to 10, how will you rate yourself as a member? If the leaders were going to rate you, what do you think the leaders will give you? 1 to 10. Think about this because ultimately, the leaders, we represent God. We are answerable to God. And members, because the leaders represent God, your submissions or your insubordination is also answerable to God. I'm going to give us some time to think and I'm going to pray at the end. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. We pray that you will help us to constantly evaluate ourselves and see whether we are your people living together as the church to glorify your name, to live in a way that is pleasing to you, as glorifying to you in this before this watching world. That at the end of the day, Lord, we want to honor you and to glorify you. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.